Hi, my name's Mark. I, I work for Utility Warehouse. We are not known as Utility Warehouse Noughts. I'm not actually sure what the, what the term for a Utility Warehouse employee is. I'll figure it out. Um, I'm going to avoid pigs, but yeah. Uh, this is an interesting... I think we're actually at an almost record attendance for this. So I'm going to go for a second record, which is that we're going to do a malware talk, more or less about Go, that only has one line of code in it, and it's in Java. <laughs> so, <laughs> why are we talking about it? And this is a lightning talk, so just the, the disclaimer is we're, we're really going, or I'm going to go relatively quickly over, over a broad area. There's probably a bunch of stuff. If you know anything about malware engineering, this is going to be quite boring, because there's nothing interesting in here that you probably haven't seen already. Um, if you don't, hopefully it's reasonably enlightening. I love malware. My, my background is in, in malware research. I work in, in security and working in a utility company, you come across a fair amount of malware because people like to shoot it at you and see what happens. Um, the reason why studying it's quite interesting and the reason why studying Go malware particularly is quite interesting is because I think the more we know about it, the better. And it's just something that the more we surface and the more people are generally aware of what other folks are up to, yeah, the, the less easy it becomes to be effective at trying to hose people and take all their stuff. So we're just going to do a 10,000 foot, as I said, it, it's, it's lightning, so I'm going to try to do this in, in 10 minutes. Um, 10,000 foot guide to malware analysis, what does it actually look like? Then go malware, why is it interesting? Multi-platform is probably the big reason, but there, there are a couple of other little interesting bits and pieces about it. And then some examples, tools, libraries, and guides. If you want to become a malware author and write your own malware, go ahead, don't tell me. Let's not talk about it, I'm not interested. Um, if you're interested in actually analyzing it, then there, there are some places that you can go and take a look. And there's some really, really, really cool tools that have been built, um, built around it and using it. So the 3.2 minute guide to malware analysis, time me, see if I get it, might end up at 3.1. The general problem with it and the reason why we do it is because there's an ongoing effort to kind of stop people from stealing stuff. So generally, if you want to get into somebody's network, you have to send them something, get them to run it. It's going to do other things and um, we don't really like that. Generally, the reason why people do this, there is a, a section of people that probably do it for political gain. It's actually, in my opinion, really not that big. Mostly people do it because they're trying to steal things and make money. Um, if you kind of read that thing uh, across the, the top and, and to the right, this is research that was done by Sophos recently, and it's really just a breakdown of detected payloads, so it doesn't include a lot of the, the sort of small and bits, bits and pieces. It's stuff that gets picked up by them. The vast majority of stuff is sitting in what they call advanced malware and then ransomware and active adversary. So it's effectively binaries and payloads that are going out and they're trying to steal information. What's changed relatively recently, and this is within the last kind of call it six months to a year. In fact, you, you're seeing a lot more of it in the last six months is the approach has gone from, let's see if we can get onto somebody's network with our really cool crafted multi-platform Go executable to let's see if we can get onto somebody's network. If they don't have anything to steal, we're just going to ransom the hell out of it and try and make some money and burn everything on the way out. So that's happened quite recently with a company called Norse Hydro. If you've been following that in the, in the sort of security news, quite an interesting case. The big thing about it is they got onto the network and then that's exactly what they did, sort of ransomed, and a couple of these things popped up at the same time. They just happened to pick up the, the, the sort of press about it, I guess. So when we're actually analyzing it, so let's say we catch somebody, somebody gets a Word document or they get a binary or they get a thing that we're now interested in, what do we go ahead and do? So there, there are two things. One is static analysis and the other is dynamic analysis. And it's not very, very complicated. Compared to image analysis, it is unbelievably simple. So Static analysis is effectively dead body analysis. It's an autopsy. We just go through a binary. We look at information of interest, generally hunting for strings. Or you pick up the hash of the file, you send it to VirusTotal. Well, you go and look at VirusTotal, and you go and see if this file has appeared anywhere else. And you, you, you look and you try and determine behavior and try and determine purpose from things like strings that you pick up, which could in indicate function names, which could indicate network connections, that it's listening for something, calling something, looking at something, IP address, whatever the case might be. Dynamic analysis is a lot more fun. You pretty much detonate malware and see what it does. And that's the enjoyable part. You obviously don't do it on your machine. That would be, that'd be weird. 
Um, you do it in a VM that's kind of built and usually pointing at another VM that kind of stops it from going and doing all sorts of awkward other stuff. So um, those are the two kind of pieces that we look at. The other words that get used is malware authors don't like Captain Obvious. They generally don't want to be known as there's a lot of obfuscation and, and attempting to get around things. Uh, not always because they're interested in keeping what they do secret. In fact, generally, malware authors are, seem to be pretty poor at keeping what they do secret. Um, mostly it's so that you can get past a bunch of automatic, automated scanning tools. So ML has done many things besides keep marketing departments entertained. Um, it's also made malware hunting quite interesting when, when it's automated. So uh, tooling generally picks stuff up. So binaries will be packed. If you're in Go and you will generally, I would imagine, have used it, you can strip out interesting stuff in metadata and you can use tools like UPS to actually pack it and do it. Obfuscation is something that you see very often in the PowerShell ecosystem. So um, I want to try get this piece of PowerShell to run, so I will base64 encode it, I'll base64 encode it again, I will go and do something else crazy to it and then pull it out the other side. Um, quick way to figure out if anything's happening is just look for base64 decode being run on any system. And then, I like malware had microservices long before we did, but it's a bit clickbaity. It's not actually true. Um, most, most malware just, it tends to be multi-stage. So it's a dropper will go on and then it'll pull something down and the thing that it pulls down will do the interesting stuff. Really the key is to get something in there that starts beaconing out, talking to something else, pulling down a payload, getting interesting. And that's usually where the errors occur. So history of malware, rapidly. Windows, for the most part, is still the target. There's a growing body of research around macOS and Linux malware, but actually, fundamentally, still nothing hugely interesting. Um, the vast majority is pups, effectively, so ad wary kind of stuff, although the ad wary stuff, the grades of adware, it, it, it sort of runs from particularly grody through to stuff that just wants to show you adverts. Um, Delphi, or Delphi, depending on where you come from, is still quite widely used in the malware world. So uh, very, very easily packable, small executable, lots of fun, good at evasion, and the kind of Flash and Java applets tended to disappear. So um, that used to be the, the kind of de facto way of hosing people was just send them to a Flash page. So what's effectively happened is that targets have changed, attack services have changed, and financial instruments have changed. So the way that you can actually squeeze money out of it. What hasn't changed is that people still click on links. Um, they still insert USB drives, and they still download software cracks, which is a very, very popular way of distributing malware. It is unbelievable how many things come along with some version of Adobe Photoshop crack, and then people just go ahead and you just merrily install that executable, so they didn't even have to send you a badly spelt phishing link. Um, people don't patch, and sophistication in malware exists. Sorry, that should be a uh, exists plural. Um, but so does shoddy code and basic mistakes. So a lot of stuff that looks like fundamentally it could have been quite good ends up being given up. My suspicion is when malware authors discover TDD, we're all doomed. <laughs> so why Go? This is the Go part, and there is our only line of code. So Go, as you know, is a compiled binary. Works on multiple platforms. Excellent tool, tool chain. Very fast. Has great features and plenty of libraries and handy activities. So if you want to write something, gets onto somebody's machine, scans for SSH keys, does some opportunity connect, uh, connections, um, takes a screen grab and then does stuff with it. Go is absolutely phenomenal for it. You can do it all with, with limited effort. Um, it's relatively easy to understand. And the disclaimer there is it's relatively easy to understand. That doesn't mean it's relatively easy to do well. It's just easy to understand. And there's limited evidence that malware authors care about concurrency. So that's not the reason they use it. Uh, generics, yeah, well, fine. <laughs> Obligatory generic joke. A um, couple of arguments against it. People complain that, or say, you know, Java's multi platform, you can use it. Yeah, sure, right. I mean, you just don't want to be doing malware in Java. And to actually get that running across a whole lot of different JVMs wouldn't work. C can be compiled on everything. Yes, it can. But then you've got things like memory management and uh, no standard library. And you just have to do everything yourself. So nobody does that. Python and PowerShell, very, very popular and still get used, but you've then got to obfuscate it, otherwise you're, you're not going to get through filters, and we will always have Delphi, which actually pops up relatively soon. So here's some interesting Go malware examples. These are available, so go and... They, uh, in fact, I think everything apart from one or two of the links at the back are, are fairly safe. You can go ahead and click on them. 
Uh, APT 28 had quite, so this is all relatively recent. So everything up on here is 2018, 2019. Um, they changed their attack. They used to do stuff in Visual C and some other bits and pieces, and then suddenly started delivering Go binaries. It's spear phishing, so these tend to be targeted attacks from APT 28s and advanced persistent threat, lots of activity through Asia. Um, bizarrely, the last piece of malware and, and one of the, I think it's in that second analysis over there, goes to all this trouble. It's a really wonderfully written Go binary, properly packed, gets onto a machine and then pulls down a Delphi payload. So there you go. Um, rock group, so that's broad based. So that's an example. The top one's an example of um, targeted. The middle one is an example of broader. They, they do mining malware. Um, the packing was interesting on this one. And again, the write-ups quite interesting. So they took a Go binary. Obviously, Go binaries are quite big. So the idea is to get them down as small as possible. So you don't want any debug information in there. There's, there's some quite good work around reconstructing metadata so you can get an idea of what it does. But you can eventually kind of get them reasonably smallish. Like three meg is small now. It never used to be small. These days, it's small. Um, that rock group one, that was an interesting sample because it was packed with UPX. And you can usually tell because it has a header they changed the header to read LSD, and then they had this really cool hippie-themed sort of malware throughout. Um, so at least it was entertaining to look at. They were using Pastebin, so uh, you find a lot of people don't necessarily beacon out to command and control servers. They get sneaky, and that's changed in the last year or two or three. Their example, Pastebin is commonly used. Twitter's been used. Britney Spears' blog has been used. So they actually pasted a comment, and this thing would go and look at a Britney Spears blog comment and figure out what to do next and go ahead and do it. That wasn't written in Go. That was written in something else. So Rock Group, they, they sort of transitioned. That was a lot of Python. They moving across into Go. And then the JCry ransomware, regrettably, poses a flash update, and people still click on it. There's a lot of other stuff that is currently going there. I think what's interesting and what the kind of theme that comes out of it in the 10-minute lightning talk is it's increasing. And it's surprising it's not being used more. So if you see people that look quite suspicious at meetups like this with hoodies taking copious notes about multi-platform stuff specifically. <laughs> so things to go and poke. What can you look at? That top talk is great. It's a B-sides talk by a guy called Joachim Kennedy. Um, he dives into how you exfil metadata from a compressed Go binary. So you think you've stripped everything out, and it turns out you really haven't. And they've written some really interesting tooling around it, uh, a lot of which I don't think has been open sourced, but there's some, there's some go-to places to take a look at, but a really great talk to watch. Um, Gscript is, is pretty well known, fantastic library. It, it, it really is. I know that um, one or two of the authors are quite, quite active on the on the go for Slack, and it's, it's effectively a multi-platform red team toolkit. What makes it quite interesting is you compile this binary for wherever you want to deploy it to, but the payload itself is JavaScript, and then it just effectively wraps a V8 engine and goes and deploys that JavaScript, which is quite nice, because it's quite an interesting way of kind of getting it out there. And you've, um, I think there are, there are a couple of subtle upsides that I don't fully understand, but it, it's interesting engineering to look at. Um, reverse engineering, if you're interested, Ghidra is, so I, I didn't mention it three or four slides ago, but there's this perception that malware analysis is all about reverse engineering and understanding assembler. Um, it helps, but it's really not necessary. A lot of it is, it, a lot of the time, it's just about kind of looking at the behavior of an executable and the obvious stuff. Reverse engineering is used mostly to look for the sort of more subtle nuances and when there really aren't any other clues. Having said that, it's still a lot of fun. Um, what hasn't been widely published, or I hadn't seen it widely published, was the, the sort of online Ghidra, like how do you use this thing, what do you do, how do you get started? So that's available now. Even if it's not from a malware perspective, it's quite interesting to take a look at the stuff that you're producing and take a look at how to optimize it and what it's doing and what is there and what metadata is available. IDA, which I'm putting down as a paid alternative to Ghidra, Ghidra would probably put itself down as a free alternative to IDA. Um, it's a reverse engineering tool as well, um, or an analysis tool. It actually has a Golang helper that has a lot of, uh, it's written in Python, if I remember correctly, and you can actually go there and you can see how it reconstructs a lot of the function names and bits and pieces out of header metadata. And then GitHub topic search, I think, is, is really underused, <coughs> or I certainly underuse it, but it's quite handy. So if you throw something at it like malware sample, you'll get back all sorts of things called malware sample with that particular topic. 
try throwing in Golang malware. You'll get some interesting stuff back that I'm not putting out in public. So that's about it. We're hiring. That's an evil gopher. Um, obligatory uh, hiring pitch, but it really is fun. We're sort of, yeah, make extensive use of Golang. We haven't written any malware as far as I'm aware <laughs> yet. And that's it from me. Thank you.